Thank you so much for joining us this morning for our clinical grand rounds. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we have our, the sign up and the registration all set up. So if you didn't get a chance to sign up on your way in, please do so on your way out. Um, so it gives me a very great pleasure this morning to uh, introduce our speaker um, and our leader of our case discussion today. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Hall uh, is a clinical psychologist and a clinical fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital Behavioral Medicine Program, and he's also one of our senior fellows at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in our uh, T32 Osher Research Fellowship in Integrative Medicine. Um, and it's my, you know, delightful pleasure uh, to have him uh, speak today to us, together with his esteemed panel discussants, uh, to talk about a very important uh, area, the management of fear of cancer recurrence. Dr. Hall. Thank you, Gloria. And I, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for braving the elements to make it to the presentation this morning. Um, it's an honor to come and present with you all about this important topic of, of taming the fear of recurrence monster in cancer, uh, mind, body, skills, and case presentation. I also want to extend gratitude to the Osher Center for this invitation. All right, so uh, this morning I'll present a little bit of background on the literature on fear of cancer recurrence. We'll then um, introduce Marsha, a, a cancer survivor, to come and share her experiences with uh, uncertainty and fear of recurrence after treatment ends. And then I'll provide a treatment rationale for a multimodal mind-body uh, approach for managing uncertainty and fear of cancer recurrence and because I met Marsha through the context of a pilot intervention that is currently underway, I wanted to share a little bit of the methods and preliminary findings from that study. And then we'll bring up uh, several of Marsha's uh, multidisciplinary care team to share their perspectives on managing uncertainty and fear of recurrence. And hopefully leaving a few times for Q a, f a few minutes at the end for Q&A. So I want to begin with a quote. Um, this is by uh, American journalist and author Jonathan Alter, who is a lymphoma survivor. And I first came across this quote a few years ago, and it's really stood with me as I've gone down this path of studying uncertainty and fear of recurrence. And he said, the only constant in cancer is inconstancy. The only certainty is a future of uncertainty, a truism for all of modern life but one made vivid by life-threatening illness. And one thing that I've learned um, as a researcher and a psychologist who works with patients every day managing uncertainty is that we can never really reduce uncertainty altogether. Instead, we can learn to tolerate it and manage it and live life uh, with meaning. And so uh, we'll come back to this idea of managing uncertainty day to day throughout the talk. So after diagnosis of a chronic or life-threatening illness, patients are confronted with uncertainty about recurrence or progression, how to manage their disease, how to interpret physiological changes in their bodies, and new roles, including when and how to engage in medical visits and tests. These uncertainties commonly manifest as fear of recurrence, which is defined as fear, worry, or concern about illness returning or progressing. And fear of recurrence is a highly distressing concern across many of the most debilitating illnesses. For instance, fear of cancer recurrence, fear of a second myocardial infarction, um, fear of uh, exacerbation of chronic pain or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, fear of progression with HIV and multiple sclerosis. You know, and today we'll be focusing specifically on fear of cancer recurrence. So after active treatment ends, cancer patients enter this stage of surveillance that's characterized by uncertainty and self-monitoring, often faced with managing elastic somatic concerns and emotional challenges on their own. 
In 2016, a consensus panel established features of uh, clinically elevated fear of recurrence, and we now have validated screening instruments for use in clinical trials. And estimates are approximately one to two thirds of all cancer survivors endorse clinically elevated fear of cancer recurrence. So work by our group and others around the globe indicates that fear of recurrence levels are similar across adults with different types of cancers. Uh, fear of recurrence levels also don't tend to naturally remit. Um, we see same similar prevalence of clinically elevated fear of recurrence 10 years out as we do three months after completing treatment ends. Uh, there's also been some work primarily with a group in Germany um, disentangling fear of cancer recurrence from established psychiatric anxiety disorders. Um, and we know that fear of recurrence does not overlap with um, things like generalized anxiety disorder or what used to be referred to as hypochondriasis. So what triggers fear of recurrence? Broadly, stimuli that have um, one, one or more of these four characteristics. So the first is having lack of information. Um, this is having unanswered questions. And for cancer survivors, this often comes up when waiting for results from scans or blood tests. There's ambiguity. And this happens whenever information is unclear or conflicting. So for instance, not knowing how to interpret changes in the body, like pain and fatigue, that can persist for years after cancer treatment ends. Ambiguity also arises when receiving conflicting information. So reconciling uh, recommendations from your cancer care team with what your neighbor or close friend said worked well for them. There's also complexity. Um, this is getting a lot of attention now. Uh, as cancer survivors are transitioning from care with their oncology team through to their primary care providers, knowing kind of who to ask uh, when can generate complexity and often will trigger fears of recurrence. And then finally, unpredictability about the course of recovery, um, not knowing how or when symptoms may return or improve, or how having had cancer may affect themselves or others over time. So a recent meta-synthesis of 87 qualitative studies of the experience of fear of cancer occurrence had this uh, conclusion. And this is um, a metasynthesis that's in press now. And this word multidimensional really stood out to me. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there are at least seven published theoretical models of fear of cancer recurrence. And all of them suggest that fear of recurrence arises and persists due to mind-body interactions between psychological factors, somatic or physical symptoms, and behavioral responses. So with the physio physiological component, we know that somatic symptoms that trigger fear of cancer recurrence commonly include pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, numbness, gastrointestinal upset. And these symptoms may be due to having cancer. They may be due to consequences of treatments or simply due to aging. Um, moreover, like any fear-based reaction, fear of cancer recurrence can trigger the fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, and over time, repeated activation of the stress response may contribute to cancer survivors having poor long-term emotional and physical health. There are cognitive factors as well. These include patients' appraisals or interpretations of somatic symptoms, um, their ability to tolerate uncertainty, which varies for each of us, um, as well as their rumination about cancer or its effects. There are behavioral responses, and these include broadly patients' attempts to assert control over the unpredictability of their health. Um, these are the four common types of behavioral responses that have been found in research on fear of recurrence to date. Um, so reassur reassurance seeking can take the form of seeking reassurance from doctors or even seeking unnecessary cancer screening, um, or conversely, avoiding these altogether. Uh, patients may engage in excessive self-examination and even avoidance health behaviors such as drinking alcohol. And finally, uh, there are, of course, emotional um, correlates with fear of cancer recurrence, most commonly documented 
a lot of emotional distress, but in extreme cases, hopelessness, demoralization, even increased rates of uh, suicidal ideation. So over the past five years, my colleagues and I have conducted a series of mostly observational studies finding empirical support for fear of cancer occurrence as a central role linking physiological, cognitive, behavioral, and emotional processes. But given the scope of today's presentation, um, it's not a research grand rounds. I don't have time to review each of these studies in detail, but I do want to point out our most recent work in this area. So for study four, uh, we were able to replicate this model with data from close to 300 cancer patients who were seeking care at uh, Mass, Mass General uh, Cancer Center, who were treated with curative intent. 85% um, of the sample endorsed some to very much fear, fear of cancer occurrence. And we observed that fear of recurrence um, accounted for 44% of the variance in distress levels over and above things uh, related to their course of treatment or time since treatment. Um, we also found that this model of fear of recurrence explained a significant amount of variance in health behavior change, most uh, notably increased alcohol consumption and lower physical activity. But these findings are currently under review. In study five, um, Dr. Tina Luberto, myself, and our colleagues dem demonstrated this cyclical pattern with a patient treated for fear of recurrence using mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So collectively, our research underscores fear of recurrence as a mind-body phenomenon spanning across physiological, cognitive, behavioral, and emotional domains. So now I want to introduce Marcia. Um, Marcia is a 68-year-old uh, divorced white mother of two who completed active treatment for ER-positive, HAR2-negative, stage one, breast cancer in June of 2017, and I first met Marsha as a participant in the research study that I'll tell you more about in just a little bit, but for now I'd like to invite Marsha up to share a little bit about her experience. So um, I went in for my yearly mammogram, yeah, no symptoms, just I'm going to go in, get my breast squished and then I'm going to be fine, right? And I get a call back saying, or I get told that I have to come back in and get some more studies done. And then maybe we need a biopsy, maybe we need two biopsies. And it's like, oh my God, what's going on here? This is totally out of the blue, totally out of the blue, no symptoms or anything. Um, and I would say that the confounding factor at that particular point for me was that my job that I had had for more than 25 years decided that they wanted to change projects and that my project was going to be eliminated at the end of the year. So December 31st, 2016, there would be no job. And I had my biopsy on the 29th of December. And on the 4th of January, I get a call from my PCP saying, sit down, you have breast cancer, in which you sort of go, oh my God, what's going on here? Um, so it was, it was a whole lot, it was, it was like both rugs of my life, my health and my job were gone. And what do I do? My nice PCP had made an appointment with Mike Hassett, Dr. Hassett, and I went to, and the surgeon, and so I went to see oncology in a couple of days, and you know, the, pre the treatment process happened. I started chemo on March 8th, so just about two years ago today, almost. Um, had chemo, I had four, four rounds of AC chemo and waited a month, and then I had uh, 18 doses of radiation. I had a lumpectomy in there, too. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, lumpectomy. <laughs> Talk about uncertainty. I woke up after the lumpectomy at the Faulkner, and I'm hearing, hearing the news that they're talking about how many people were at my inauguration. And I'm like, I need Versed again. Just give me Versed. Maybe I'll wake up and it'll be over. <laughs> it'll change. But no, unfortunately, it doesn't change. Um, and that's really sort of symbolic of the uncertainty of, of my cancer as well. I mean, things. So um, I had all that. I started 
In the middle of this, I was still trying to finish up as a consultant a project, so I'm doing um, a study. I, I, I was doing food safety um, evaluations, and I'm running a, a, what they call a um, rain trial in Europe while I'm having my chemo. Um, I was the uh, reunion chair for my class's reunion, so I did that too. So I did a whole lot of things that sort of kept me at least semi-focused <laughs> while I was having all of all of the cancer. Um, finished finished my treatment, and I think this was probably the really salient thing that my my treatments, my my chemo, my lumpectomy and radiation, and my chemo were all finished um, mid June. And finishing. Uh, radiation where you go in every single day for however many weeks you're going. You finish that and then all of a sudden you don't have any appointments for months. And it was this, that, that sort of was another kind of carpet being pulled out from underneath your feet that the people who were there who were caring for you all the time, I mean, it's not that they don't care anymore, but you're not going in there to touch base with them every day. And so that's, I think, one of the big places where uncertainty in cancer diagnosis comes through and all of that. So that was in June, started Letrozole um, mid-July, and then I worked um, with you um, starting in the fall, and then I did the mindful meditation class with Patty Arcari in um, the following winter. So I did a whole lot of, of work with meditation, with mindfulness, um, and sort of how to how to tame the sphere of recurrence, how to tame, tame the uncertainty of the diagnosis. And one thing that I, I did want to say is one the the, the Dana Farber is a fantastic place for it, being a cancer patient. I walked in the first day of my chemo, for the first chemo treatment, and I said, you know, I am really really pissed. I am just so furious about having breast cancer, and this is making me really, really upset. And I went in, started, you know, you're there for hours getting all the various treatments, and Julie walked in. She said, hi, I hear you're angry. <laughs> Maybe we could talk. <laughs> and that was starting me on a very nice, another path of taking care of me, not just as a, can as a patient, not just as a an illness, but as a whole total body person. So um, thank you for that. And um, I had talked to Anne, who unfortunately can't be here today because she's stuck in Florida after the storm. Um, but she was the one who sort of directed my um, everything uh, also with Mike. So, oh, and here's my... Um, <laughs> So the model. So the cognitive thing was always these negative automatic thoughts. You start thinking and it's like, oh, this is going to happen. Oh, I'm never going to be great. Um, I think one of the biggest negative automatic thoughts with a breast cancer patient with chemo is that your hair falls out. And you look in the mirror and you go, who the hell is that? Um, and it's it's never accepting of you, but and and everything. So that was a, a big thing. There are all these shoulds. I shouldn't have gotten cancer because I was taking care of myself, I was going to the gym, I lost all this weight, you know, all these things that you're told to do to keep cancer from coming back, and I'd already done them. So why am I doing this? And, and it sort of means, well, you can work on fortune telling, but, you know, I've already done it, and so I guess it's, it's just, you know, life is over. Um, I had a lot of joint discomfort and continue to have some because the letrozole makes you a, a little bit stiff. And I don't think it's just stiffness from me getting older. I think it's, it's stiffness from the letrozole. So work on that. I've had a lot of sleep disturbance. I think that's not uncommon for <laughs> A, menopausal women, and B, for people who've been ill. Um, and I think that the, uh, the sleep disturbances are um, really help by the meditation and things. And, and there's some sexual issues, not a huge issue for me because, um, because I'm not married right now and not in, in a, um, a relationship. But there are underlying sexual issues that come up, just physiological sexual issues with cancer. Um, 
one of the things that I did this behavioral model is that I also have diabetes, and so I was very concerned about what the effect, and this may be one of the biggest negative thoughts, is what, what's the cancer going to do to my diabetes? Um, so that was a um, big problem, what's cholesterol? And that's been, um, been something that I've had, I, not that I've made changes, but I continue to monitor that. And Dr. Google gives you all sorts of great information, and you have to worry about, uh, you know, <laughs> not maybe going to Dr. Google and, and finding everything, you know, keeping that piece of the what ifs out of your head. Um, and of course, for me, I've been, you know, a scientist and working for years and years and years, and I don't have a job. What do I do now? And I, you know, my identity was very much shaken by everything that went on there. Okay. Thank you so much, Marsha. And uh, later on in the presentation, Marsha will come back to share uh, specific skills that she learned through the pilot intervention and how she's continuing to apply them today. So um, Marsha helped us uh, really illustrate that fear of recurrence can you know, stem, uh, can, can pan across these different mind-body domains. And so, uh, my colleagues and I were curious to understand what has been done so far for intervention approaches that could help Marsha and other cancer survivors managing these fears. And we recently published a systematic review and meta-analysis of uh, interventions that have been tested through randomized controlled trials. We uh, found 19 RCTs to date. And what was really stood out to us is that half of these trials have been published really just in the last three to four years which really speaks to the developing, uh, you know, this is a very hot area, a developing area that's getting a lot of attention as it should. What are the intervention approaches that have been tested so far? Uh, most commonly, interventions teach cognitive behavioral skills, and I'll define that a little bit more later on. Uh, also, various types of meditative practices, seated meditation or meditative movement, and to a lesser extent, training in relaxation and positive psychology. And what we found across these interventions were pulled small to medium-sized effects reductions in fear of cancer recurrence, um, which is encouraging, but also let us know that there's some room for continued improvement. We ran some exploratory analyses to try to identify characteristics of interventions that yielded the highest reductions in fear of recurrence. And these interventions tended to be multimodal, which means they included more than one of the skills listed on the screen. Um, and they were tended to be delivered in groups. So our question was, could an intervention combining these ingredients uh, be feasible and lead to uh, not small to medium-sized reductions in fear of recurrence, but large size reductions in fear of recurrence? And so um, I'll share a little bit now about the intervention that uh, Marsha participated in, and that is currently underway. Um, so the primary aim of our study is to examine the feasibility and acceptability of an adapted multimodal mind-body group intervention to reduce fear of recurrence among adult cancer survivors. And this design, it's a single arm intervention proof of concept study with multiple follow-up assessments. We've enrolled 23 cancer survivors to date and run uh, participants through the program in four cohorts. Cohorts one and two are complete, have completed the protocol um, Marsha was in w one of those first cohorts. Um, cohort three is completing follow-up assessments, and cohort four is currently receiving the intervention. Um, we conducted the study at BIDMC, and the primary eligibility criterion I want to point out is that most of the research um, that's been done on interventions for fear of recurrence have been exclusively with breast cancer survivors, and so we, and we know that um, survivors of various forms of cancers experience elevated fear of recurrence, so we wanted to open up eligibility to a broader array of uh, survivors of different types of cancers. So we based our adaptations uh, on an existing multimodal mind-body intervention that many in the room may be familiar with. This is the SMART 3RP. Um, it's housed currently at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine at Mass General Hospital. 
This core intervention includes many of the features of interventions that we identified in our systematic review that could really help patients manage fear of recurrence and addresses some of the limitations that we encountered. So it's um, eight sessions. Each session lasts an hour and a half. It's delivered to groups. You can see the skills listed on the screen. It's fairly comprehensive. Um, and it's been efficacious in reducing distress in a variety of medical populations. And really importantly, it's based on a theoretical model and includes a treatment manual, which for someone like me is very helpful when you're adapting an intervention um, and also wanting to make sure that it is being applied the same way with each of your groups. So I want to share uh, the integrated fear of recurrence treatment model that we developed when we were adapting the program. What you see on the screen is the original um, treatment model for the SMART 3RP program. And highlighted in red were a few of the conceptual um, adaptations that we made. And I'll spend a moment now just going through um, each of these bubbles to give you a sense for what the intervention entails. Uh, Mind-body practices on the top left corner. These include practices for enhancing mindful awareness, reducing chronic activation of the stress response, and increasing exposure to the relaxation response. One example modification that we made in our pilot intervention was framing mindful awareness as a tool to increase tolerance of uncertainty, um, specifically by grounding oneself in the certainty of the breath, of the present breath, um, the certainty of each of your senses, and the certainty of what you're observing moment to moment. Uh, cognitive behavioral techniques are meant for increasing awareness of stressors, enhancing metacognition, or the ability to think about your thoughts, um, and also learning to flexibly apply thoughts that are more balanced, fair, and helpful to you. Um, some example modifications that we made in this program included following up judgmental thoughts or should statements um, about one's cancer experience with thoughts of self-compassion. Um, also, we introduced a behavioral technique called worry time um, for developing behavioral patterns that will reduce the severity, duration, and consequences of fear recurrence-based reactions. For adaptive strategies, these primarily include health behaviors and positive psychology skills of self-compassion, humor, and gratitude, which are meant to facilitate meaning-making, interpersonal connection, and personal growth. Um, some example modifications we made were teaching gratitude um, uh, for the gratitude journaling exercise, we asked participants to specifically reflect on gratitude for someone who helped you along during your cancer experience and helps you manage uncertainty as a cancer survivor. Another adaptation we made was we incorporated um, recommendations from NCCN and American Cancer Society on health behavior guidelines for cancer survivors. Um, because we know certain types of health behavior change can reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. So through resiliency processes, uh, patients will reduce fear of cancer recurrence severity and increase overall resilience, according to our model. And they do this, on the one hand, by using stress management skills and greater tolerance of uncertainty. And this helps patients reduce maladaptive thoughts, emotions, and behaviors associated with fear of recurrence. And on the other hand, patients will learn um, growth enhancement skills like optimism, um, and uh, I'm sorry, and also optimism about the future, specifically to increase their cognitive flexibility for when they're thinking about the future in a fearful way, they're able to generate other types of thoughts about the future that are more helpful, balanced, and fair to them, and to engage in pro-social behaviors to connect um, more meaningfully with those that can offer social support. So I want to just briefly share a little bit about the study flow for the pilot intervention before we come back to um, some of the key takeaways that Marcia shared with us from our program. Um, so very briefly, through recruitment, through recruitment at BIDMC outpatient cancer clinics, we identified 68 cancer survivors for screening. 25 patients were ineligible primarily because they had completed their treatments beyond uh, the window that we had set for this pilot intervention. We ended up enrolling 20, 23 cancer survivors for an enrolled eligible rate of 58%. And 
I think there, you know, there are really two things that I want to point out on this slide of the study flow so far. First is that we've had high rates of, um, of completion and, uh, and att very low rates of attrition uh, throughout the intervention as well as through our follow-up surveys. And of the participants who have received the intervention so far, their rating, 87% um, have high to very high levels of acceptability to the amount that they're enjoying the content and engaging with it, odds of future use, et cetera. And we're also seeing high rates of in-person session attendance. Um, a little bit of the characteristics of the participants in the program. Uh, on average, they're 61 years old and about a year out from completing their treatment. Uh, most of the participants are women and non-Hispanic white. And we are seeing a diversity in the types of cancers that participants had been treated for. Um, and most of the participants had completing uh, surgery and chemotherapy. So I want to share uh, a few trends in pre-post survey uh, scores on a few of the key um, sort of psychological and behavioral and physiological constructs that we're interested in measuring. This should be interpreted you know, as really preliminary, again, with the caveat, this is in a single arm design. There's no control group, and it is a small end so far. But overall, what we're seeing are uh, large effect size reductions in fear of cancer recurrent severity. Cohen's D for interpretation, 0.8 or higher, tend to reflect large size reduction or large size effects. We're seeing uh, moderate to large size reductions in triggers of fear of cancer recurrence, uh, functional impairment, and reduction in intolerance of uncertainty. For stress and distress, we're seeing large effect size reductions in distress specific to fear of cancer recurrence, as well as more broad general distress. And finally, we wanted to measure um, potential benefits related to coping and specific types of stress management skills that we were teaching in our program. And we're seeing that participants are reporting large size um, improvements in their ability to cope specifically with fear of recurrence as well as to engage skills related to relaxation, being aware of signs of stress or tension in the body, um, their confidence in being able to cope in various situations, and their overall resiliency. So uh, briefly, I want to share Marsha's fear of cancer recurrence treatment model. Um, a lot of these responses were pulled from an exit interview that Marsha completed with our qualitative interviewer after completing the um, pilot intervention, as well as preparing for today's talk, Marcia gave me some feedback on a few of these bullet points. Um, one of the key meditative practices that she really took out of the program was uh, mindful walking and mindful gardening, as well as engaging the relaxation response specifically through uh, different types of breathing exercises and using imagery. Some of the cognitive behavioral skills that she described um, using were sort of balancing those should statements that she talked about earlier with self-compassion, um, as well as refraining from uh, engaging with Dr. Google. So uh, you know, we might say sort of abstaining from the reassurance-seeking behavior of looking up information online. Uh, some of the adaptive strategies that she took away from the program included gratitude journaling, which I understand she's still continuing to use, um, using humor to cope with um, really challenging experiences related to cancer survivorship, and some of the um, health behavior guidelines for improving sleep, um, sleep hygiene. This led to Marsha endorsing less stress, specifically less of something that we call scanxiety, or distress around waiting for test results, and also less insomnia. She also described areas of growth. Um, some of these areas included pro-social connection with other cancer survivors and being involved in different cancer-related groups or advocacy, as well as engaging in creative expression and some of the art projects, which she'll share a little bit uh, about today. And this led Marsha to share with me over email something that uh, we were really you know, hoping for uh, through this intervention and really more broadly in, in this field. She said, taming the fear of recurrence monster doesn't mean knowing that the cancer won't come back, 
but being secure in the understanding that the fear doesn't have to guide you every day. And all you can do is to live today. So with that, I'd like to invite Marcia back up in case there is anything on this slide that I mischaracterized or something else that she might like to add, and then she'll share a little bit about a creative project she's engaging in. Um, so I think a couple of the things that I do um, a lot, the frequency goes up and down depending on where I am in my life. To last night after I fell on the black ice, I did a lot of sleep hygiene meditation <laughs> before I went to sleep. Um, but I do have those skills, those, those, um, those skills and those opportunities available to me. Um, something that I've used a lot for meditation that I've find really helpful is um, Insight Timer because there's just, you can use a lot of different meditations depending on what you're feeling and what you want to do. So I, I do like that um, a great deal. There are things like Calm that are good, but um, and then Patty has some very nice uh, meditations on the, on the Dana-Farber website for the Zakem Center that are very, very helpful. Um, I'm really working on mindful walking. It's one of my, my sort of meditative practices. And the mindful walking is sometimes literally going out and just, you know, walking sort of a pattern or, you know, sort of a labyrinth. But more, mindful walking to me means making sure that you know where your foot's going at every moment. And I have a new hat with little lights on it because I walk a dog. And in the, win in the winter, when it gets dark at 5 o'clock, you can't see your feet, you can't see the sidewalk, and cars can't see you. So my little L.L. Bean hat with the little lights is really great because I can see my feet. And it helps me be mindful about where I'm stepping my feet. And that mindfulness reminds me to be thinking about where I set my not only literal feet, but my figurative feet in my life. Um, I try very hard to be compassionate of myself to think about you know what I'm doing and how I can be compassionate to self-compassionate about something whatever I'm thinking um, gratitude journaling journaling is important um, reminding myself at the end of every day what was good what was bad and what was eh, sort of so-so but the, um, and that's a skill that I learned first in your um, class and then did a lot when I was working with Patty in the meditation, mindfulness meditation program at the Farber. Um, one, um, I've, the decrease in stress is really great because now I know that if I'm waiting for a test result, that it back up and say that there are people in my, I, I look at the Komen Breast Cancer Facebook page, and there are a lot of people who are always having like, oh, anxiety about scans and tests and all that. And I, I think that one of the things that I like about the way that I've been treated um, with Dr. Hassett is that there aren't a great number of scans. Partly it's because the kind of cancer that I have, you don't need to do scans to see if you have turned into an MBC, because that's probably not going to happen, or it's not going to happen yet. And um, you only get scans if you kind of need it, not just as a matter of fact. They're not, uh, not all these testing. So all I have is a mammogram once a year and a manual exam. And as long as I'm feeling OK, I'm good. And I think that that's great. But I did have my first mammogram back was had new calcifications. And I could use these skills that I learned to say, OK, I am freaking out, but this is what I can do. And there's the wonderful healing garden at the, the Dana-Farber. I went in there between the mammogram and my appointment. And I was able to sit there and to breathe and to calm down and walked in and could actually discuss what the issue was rather than being frightened. So taking that fear away makes me be more rational and makes allows me to be more rational about things. Um, and then I've been doing a lot of pro-social things. I'm actually president of my class now for our upcoming 
50th reunion? God, I think I'm 18 or maybe 45, <laughs> and how could that be? But no, I'm, I'm working with my class to generate a few years down the road yet a, a very nice and very meaningful 50th reunion, and that means that I'm talking to a lot of my classmates who have similar problems. I mean, the, the breast cancer in my, I went to Wellesley, so it's women, and we had 120 people at reunion, and of those 120 people, I think probably 25 had breast cancer, which is just you know huge. And they knew I had, so I, I they talked to me about it. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk about the art projects. Um, yeah, just, yeah. So one of the things that that I have done. Um, one of the nurses in the radiation oncology program talked to me and said they were doing a workshop, would I like to attend? And this was with EDI, which is a, a an art project, a guy named Stephen something. Uh, and he has developed this app where you take a picture and when you use it from his um, when I learned it, I got you get an iPad that had lots of pictures. You just pull down a picture, and then you start playing with it. And there are lots of ways to change the picture. And you begin to tell stories by the way you change the picture. And so you don't always, you know, the picture you start out with could be a tuna sandwich and end up being some kind of a huge dream. And I really like this, and I do, I do. this is something that I, I play with um, off and on, and I have it on my iPad. And when I lost access, I called him and said, I need it. I can't do without it. But these are a couple of the images that I, I did. And this first one on the left, I did right after I finished my therapy, my, my active therapy. And this sort of represents to me, I call it taking flight. These are sandhill cranes in Alaska. That's the original image. And the sandhill cranes come, and they nest in the summer, in the spring and summer. and they are, are brought, they are fledged, they are cared for by their parents, and you see the family group. There's a mother and a father and one fledgling, maybe two. They're being cared for very closely the whole summer, and they teach them to fly, and you see them learning to fly in the air, and they're, they're just so wonderful and beautiful. And then when they're ready to fly, the flocks go, and they fly from Alaska, this is in um, Homer, the Kenai Peninsula. They fly to the Central Valley in California. And they have to be prepared. They're, they can fly. They can get food for themselves. And then they go. But they have this journey. And there's the mountain in the background. You're, they're going over the mountains, over the ocean, thousands of miles to get to the place where they're going to spend the winter. And they have to be ready. And, and it's just so so was such a, a powerful statement to me of what breast cancer treatment was, that you, you're taken to the point with all of your therapy to then be ready, and to be ready to go. And somebody, somebody has taught you and trained you that you can go. And so that was what that did for me. That not, I, I could feel that I was alone, and I was on a dangerous path, but that someone had trained me, that I had gotten all the care that I needed. So that's, that was just my really powerful image there. Huh? Yeah. And then the other one is just a, um, it, it's actually a, um, a teaching, a, a teaching block for my, my brother-in-law made this. But the hands there, you support and you give support. And depending on how you look at it, you can either be giving support or receiving support. And that was just really important to me. That's great. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, and just one thing about, about the meditation. It's been in my life for a long time. I mean, the, the sort of the techniques. When I was in graduate school in the 70s um, at the public health school at Harvard, we met Dr. Benson, and he came and gave a workshop for us. And um, then I, had a, I was at UMass Med School in the physiology department for a while and was particip or sometimes participating in a carpool. And John Cabot's in, Dr. <laughs> Mindfulness, was one of the members of the carpool. So, All right. Wow, thank you so much, Marcia, um, for, for sharing this part of your journey. So now I'd like to segue um, 
I think uh, we have about 10 minutes or so for a panel discussion. And so now I'd like to invite up our panelists. Um, Dr. Patty Arkari is the program manager for meditation and mindfulness in the Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies and Healing Living at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And as Marsha mentioned, Patty taught Marsha mindfulness meditation courses after she completed our mind-body intervention. So um, would our discussants please, please come up and grab a seat. Uh, Dr. Michael Hassett is the medical director of clinical informational information systems at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, and Michael is Marsha's oncologist. And uh, unfortunately, Ms. Ann Kelly uh, isn't able to join us today, but she was a nurse practitioner um, at uh, Zakem Center and was Marsha's nurse. And then Ms. Julie Sa Julia Salinger uh, is a licensed independent clinical social worker at Dana-Farber, and J Julie is Marsha's uh, social worker. So we have a few guiding questions, and we'll see what we have time to get through today. One of the first questions for our panelists, oh, do we have microphones? So the first question is, in your practice, how do cancer survivors discuss their fear of recurrence um, and uncertainty about recurrence? Yeah, Patty, we well, like in it. the um, mind body resilience course that um, Marsha participated in, um, we're very fortunate to have the work of the Benson Henry um, program to uh, use as a model. So we're very much steeped in the model that looks at um, physiologic, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral um, facets of the fears. And with mindfulness as the sort of foundational. Uh, quality that helps people get at what they're experiencing, we're able to process those uh, fears in a very uh, concrete, substantive way, and eventually get at uh, outcomes and solutions to problem solve, as well as to uh, cognitively restructure and just be present with more of those healing qualities that we talked about, specifically the self-compassion and acceptance pieces. Great. I would say that uh, I, I want to pick up on something that, that came up earlier, which uh, really is, as I see this fear of recurrence, which seems to, in my practice, change over time. Uh, I find that, that a lot of the patients that I see experience um, a lot of fear of recurrence right after the diagnosis, which is, I think, very understandable. But something that you said, um, you know, after finishing treatment is also, also a very... Um, uh, ripe time for, for that, that symptom. And I think it's, it's just as you said, this notion that uh, while you're on treatment, you're kind of doing something, and then you kind of get to the end of the treatment, and then what? Mm -hmm. uh, so when I think about it in my practice, I think it's very dependent on where people are in their course. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the, the two times that I think are, are, are most, um, uh, most prominent. Uh, and for me, it's, it's uh, about talking about and trying to understand it. And, and also, in addition to being open about it, trying to understand how I can try to help guide a person to uh, an intervention that's most helpful to them. Okay. Uh, so. Great. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. I'll just pick up um, what Mike was saying about the end of treatment. I mean, that, that's something that's so powerful. Um, with our patients that we, we have a program, which you all may have heard of, uh, called Facing Forward After Breast Cancer, that we've had for, I think, about 25 years at Dana Farber, um, because we understand that this is such a difficult time for many uh, patients, and, and often worse than any other time, psychologically, during the whole process. So it just speaks to you know, this recognition um, of, of this particularly difficult time. Um, one of the things that I would say about it, as a social worker and helping patients with the fear, with talking about the fear of recurrence, is that sometimes it's really helping them actually articulate the fear of recurrence that's really at the base of the anxiety that is so powerful that they can't say the words, in part. In part, they can't say the words often because 
they feel that saying those words will actually make it come true. There's a lot of magical thinking that goes along. Um, and, and that helping patients see that facing it, you know, facing this monster, in a sense, actually takes away its power, demystifies it, and helping them understand that it's okay to talk about it and that it's actually helpful. Um, for some patients, that's not something that you would do because the panic is so bad that you don't want to sort of bring them into a place that they can't get out of. But for many patients, it's actually in a safe way to walk them through it actually helps a, a lot. Great. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, you all actually touched on this. How do you approach conversations with patients about fear of recurrence and related worries? Um, and similarly, what have you found to be the biggest challenge um, in helping patients manage these fears? Well, I feel like, um, as, as you might have caught a glimpse just this morning, we're so fortunate to be doing this work um, as part of a whole from, from Dr. Hassett trying to figure out how to steer to Julie's important work in facing forward to this longer term intervention that we get to um, share with patients. I think that, um, it, that that mindfulness piece starts from day one and expands so that um, it's more of a trajectory versus a one-time thing. And patients get there in their own time, in their own way. So to the degree that you can provide this whole experience, you trust that eventually patients will get to that point that they need to be within this supportive environment that we are, have the luxury of being able to provide here at Dana-Farber. Great. I just want to make two points. One is um, time. I think one of the things that's so important for addressing this is just having the taking the time to do so. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we get very busy talking about, you know, what are the side effects from your X drug or, you know, your next visit is on this date. You know, it's the, it's the, uh, it's the practical aspects of the visit that often take over and, and trying to take the time to address these issues I think is really important. Um, and. To that extent, one of the things that we're trying to do is a better job of, of doing what I would think of as surveillance for patients to know who, for whom these issues are most prominent uh, and to identify that in a very uh, systematic and, um, what's the right word, um, wide-ranging manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're working on that from an institute perspective Great. Uh, with some of the instruments that you mentioned. The other comment that I just wanted to make, and, and I think one of the advantages of having a multidisciplinary team at Dana-Farber that is so helpful is that I think, to your point, uh, different people respond to different interventions in different ways. And one of the challenges that I face is in trying to, if you will, match up the right types of interventions with the right types of patients. Julie, was there anything? I, I think the, um, one of the biggest problems, and it touches on what I, I said already, is something that um, is, you know, the wonderful positive thinking that we have in all the world and talk about and how great it is. I often see it as the tyranny of positive thinking and in this setting, um, and that it, it, it limits people's ability to allow themselves to feel what they feel. Not, not to put feelings in their head, but to allow those things that keep knocking at their door instead of pushing them away, but to actually express them and work through them. So that's a big challenge for many of our patients. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think this came up um, already in a few of your responses about being a part of a multidisciplinary team. Um, how do you see being a part of this team a multidisciplinary team um, working as advantageous or challenge in helping patients manage these fears and become more resilient. Um, and maybe similarly, um, do you have any advice for other uh, clinicians who are in your field uh, working with survivors who are cancer patients, cancer survivors who are managing, having difficulty managing these fears? <laughs> Where do you take your, sure. 
and, and I'm seeing the one minute sign, so sure. I'll try to do it in 55 <laughs> seconds. Um, I, I think just to reiterate, the, the concept of a multidisciplinary team is so essential. You know, I, I don't think that any of us could do what we do without each other. Um, and you know, I think that resonates with the, even the intervention that you mentioned, which is really a multidisciplinary intervention yeah. uh, combined with a multidisciplinary team, to me seems to provide um, the most potential uh, the only challenge that I face is, you know, how do you bring these interventions to everybody who could benefit from them? Yeah. There's only so many slots in, in this program, and there's only so many Julies, and we've tried to clone her, uh, and Marshall, you know, we try to clone these people, and it's, it's tough, but uh, just trying to get these interventions to as many people as possible, I think, is great. It's really critical. And I think also that what you said that was that we all work in different ways together. So if if I can help somebody be able to face something, then they're able to go and and seek out um, mindfulness programs because they feel safe for doing that. And they're able to go into Mike Cassett's office and ask him pointed questions that they were too afraid to ask before, which really helps them. So that it's all linked, and I think it it's uh, it works well that way. And the, maybe the other piece to that that we haven't spoken to is, and you know you presented it, Daniel, in your intervention, but the power of the group process oh, yeah. so that you're expanding the care team to all of the participants in the group that are helping each other as you did week to week, Marsha, with your group and experienced from the group the insights and the support and the sense of not being alone. So I think a group process is a really powerful medium to do this work in once you get to that intervention phase. Great. About five or six weeks before you start getting back to the mm -hmm. So an eight week group is really important. All right. With it looks like we're just about up on time, and so I wanted to see. Do we have time for a question or two? Okay. Would anyone from the audience have any questions for either our panelists, Marsha, or myself? Okay. Um, I work in radiation, so. Um, Another member of my team. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so important that we um, all the excitement of finishing chemo, radiation, you've been diagnosed, and this long trajectory of treatment, and this exciting day to finish up. But we do bring that up in discharge planning that um, some of the emotions in what just happened doesn't hit for weeks yeah. and even months, and so we do bring that up. It kind of feels funny because we're all celebrating, we're talking about skin care, but we also are bringing that up in nursing to have that support system available and that we're still available and that they're still part of the Farber team. Um, so um, I just wanted to mention that. Yet I only work with the radiation patients, but it is um, helpful mm -hmm. in our, our scope. Can you fix that so that you might think just show Oh, sure. Yeah, we can. Hi, I'm a patient from Dana Farber, and um, I'm going to say this for the first time. I have metastatic breast cancer, HER2 positive, which before was very hard to say. I moved from Brazil, and I'm very grateful to the Zykem Center and to the mindfulness class and also the social worker and of the way the teams work together because I wouldn't have been able to make it through this process to change my life. I still live in California. I don't, I'm not used to snow. So, yeah. So it's been really grateful. And like today I took my list of words that I, from my mindfulness because I have like five appointments. So I made an appointment at the Psychon Center. I'm going to get a massage and also acupuncture. And I'm like amazed how if I go to a different team, it's like the same person. And they're all like rooting for me. And it's just... It really is amazing, and I'm going to be helping Brazil bring this to other people because it's. I'm really grateful, and to be able to say that she's really right. It's really hard, and I think when you stop treatment, you don't have that care, and like these little things really make a difference. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing that. Okay, Do we have time for one more. Okay, maybe we can uh, save the, any remaining questions after we have a coffee hour 
Um, feel free to approach me or any of our panelists uh, with other questions or comments. I just wanted to briefly post this slide to um, thank my team of mentors, to thank the panelists, and of course, Marsha. Um, and I have a, a number of teams at Mass General and BIDMC who have supported me in this work. So thank you all.